Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, welcome everyone. Let's do come and find a seat. Do gather together. Try not to fall into your seat. Uh, great. Well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark for the research academy and pastor of Lighthouse Roots Church. It's really great to join together, even on this hot day. And some of you are going, I love it, it's fantastic. Some of you are melting away and saying, bring back the winter. <laughs> Maybe quite not as much as that. Good. Well, um, if you're here for the first time, a special welcome to you as well. Uh, we have some cards at the back we'd love to know and get to know you more. You can fill in a connect card. Please feel free to do so. Uh, we're going to have a great time this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Um, we've got children, we've got activities for you a little bit later. Anna and the team are going to be doing some activities for you. Uh, young people, we've got activities for you as well. Ben's going to be leading your activities a little bit later as well. Uh, Nikki's going to be leading us in worship, and Chris is going to be continuing our series uh, looking at um, the coming of the King. We're in the book of 1 Samuel, we're going to be looking at chapters 14 and 15 today. Oh, we're going to look at 15 and 16, that's right, and 14. Yeah, good. Keep me on my toes. Chris knows what he's doing, that is the main thing. Uh, we are also going to be praying for Adam and Grace and Caleb, um, and the message said that in two weeks' time we'll be praying for Vincent and Beth and Sloan and Seb, but actually we're going to be doing that today as well. So we're going to pray for the Lord today. Is that good? Great. Praise God. Uh, good. Shall we stand, Nikki, Beth? Do you want to come and join us? Yeah, if we're able, let's, let's stand. We're going to worship God together. We're going to declare our praises. We're going to encounter with him today. Uh, I, as I was preparing for today, uh, I got these verses from Isaiah 9. Um, just two verses. and We would normally read these around Christmas time. But I, I just had it with me all throughout this week and I um, just want to bring these verses to us as we begin to worship. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness. From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Thank you, Lord, that you are ruling and reigning today. That you are on your throne. That you are wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That is who you are. That is who you are to us right now. And we want to praise your name. We want to enter into your throne room. We want to be with you. We want to dwell in your presence. Holy Spirit, we say come. Holy Spirit, we say come and do something in us today. Lord, move our feet to dancing. Lift our eyes to see that you are bigger than all that we can imagine. You're bigger than any problem. That you're a God of joy, a God of life, even in the tough times and in the good times too. And we say, Lord God, come. 
we want to meet with you. We want to be in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen.
second verse there's something about looking around at each other and singing it over one another that he will pull each and every one of us through whatever we're going through so we're going to sing it again but as we do it I'd love it if we looked around and we sung it over one another that our God can do much more than we can think yeah amen amen
every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. So whatever you think is bowing, is making you bow, you tell that thing, you bow in the name of Jesus today. Amen.
um, I'm glad we sang that song because the previous song talked about nothing, nothing in front of Jesus. And actually, he's a person. <laughs> he's a person. It's no one. And I'm glad we sang that song because we're not praying to a set of rules or regulations, Lord. We're not praying to a set of things we have to do, rules and things that we can't keep. We're praying to you as a person. You are a person. You are, you have this name above every other name. And we know that there will be one day that comes where every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. And the name that will be on their lips is the name of Jesus. And we, your people, choose to put the name of Jesus on our lips today, this afternoon. We're not praying to a man with a rule book. We're praying to a man whose blood has shed, whose body was broken, whose life was poured out. That therefore means we have a complete and absolute open way into your presence every single minute and second of the day we are able to be in your presence and you come to live inside of us and if and that's by the power of your holy spirit at work and we just thank you we just stand here and say thank you precious name of jesus will you come closer to us in a way that we've never known before will you come with intimacy Will you come with gentleness? Will you come in a way that we may have known you for years, but not really known you? Will you come in a different way? In a softer, gentler, more personal way? Because we know that your name is Jesus, but you also know our name. You've called us by name. You've called us by name. We are chosen. We are chosen. We are loved. And I pray, Father, over this church that we would come into a place of intimacy with you that we have never known before, a closeness with you that we have never known before, because we need you. It was already prayed this morning, this afternoon, that we need you. Jesus, we need you. We need you to come in and commune with us. And the promise is that if you, as you come knocking on our doors, you promise to come in, to sit down, and to eat with us. There is an offer and an invitation now to say yes to Jesus in a way that means that he can come into your life and sit down and eat with you. There is an offer of intimacy, of hearing his voice, of knowing him call your name, don't miss the opportunity. Thank you for your offer, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Amen? Amen. 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 Uh, why don't you call a, a clap offering? He's, he's, he's going to ask you to Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, please do find a seat. We're going to uh, need to move on into the next part of what we've got. Thanks, Nikki. Thanks, Ben. That's great. We, um, we want to welcome uh, people into church membership today. We want to welcome Adam and Grace and Caleb, uh, Vincent and Beth, Sloan and Seb. Uh, although he's having a little nap, so he might, he might rest this one out. Um, I'm just going to read. Uh, we, we have a process called our DNA. What, what, what we look like, what Lifehouse looks like. We have a booklet. Many of you have gone through it. And I just want to read this little bit from the start. It says, We feel that it is important to share what makes us Lifehouse Community Church. To be clear on our DNA, where we have come from, what we believe in. You don't need to be a member of Lifehouse Community Church to thrive and be actively involved. But for those who do choose to become members, there are major benefits to this commitment. Members build together a solid foundation of common faith and practice. It's about partnering together. Members take responsibility together for our church's life and can celebrate together all that God accomplishes through us. Our members enjoy an increased sense of belonging and can take on specific responsibilities in church life. Membership is about unity and the need for each other. It's joining together of hearts and minds for the vision that God has given us together. Amen. Good. Uh, Adam Grace and Caleb, Vincent Beth Sloan, Seb might want to sleep, that's fine. Whatever. Do you want to come and join me at the front? This isn't just a box ticking exercise. This is a joining together of hearts and minds. Um, to be in unity of where God's leading us. And uh, each of these families have decided they want to make this their home. They want to make home with you guys. You can smile about that. You can cheer. You can cheer, yeah. Uh, and we, we want to welcome them and we want to do that by praying and blessing them as we do this. So, um, Catherine, Andy, Nikki, come and join us. Um, and if there's others that want to come and pray for these guys, come and join us as we do that right now. Actually, you've thrived really well, but actually there's a new season he has for you. 
that he wants you to thrive more. He's actually not just maintaining, but he has something for you. And that might actually be quite, might, or might have already been slightly painful where friendships have changed, where you've moved, things feel a bit different. But actually, God's really promising that he's got new for you and actually there'll be friendships that stick and there'll be ones that might fall away, but he has plans in all of that for you. I've actually almost got the same thing, but not with tomatoes. I really felt, I saw a picture of a cherry tree and the blossom is just beautiful, and I feel that's where you see yourselves, that you know, there's this beautiful blossom and God is doing some amazing things, but actually there's fruit to come, that the blossom might pass, but then there will be fruit. And I had a word come to me about a linchpin. Now, I'm not very technical, I don't really know what a linchpin is, so I had to look it up, but it's a very small part, um, and it attaches to an axle, and makes sure that a wheel goes round, and, uh, it's quite, quite insignificant in a way, but it plays an important role. And uh, at the moment, you might feel yourselves well, wondering what your role is. You've just gone to the Vista, you've just gone to go into the church, etc. But God has got big plans for you, and you are going to be an important part of what happens in this area. And he's going to use you significantly. So you may feel you're a bit insignificant at the moment, but God's got big plans for you. You're going to be an inchman. Lord, I really thank you for Adam and Grace and little Caleb. Lord, they're already such a blessing to us. And I just really thank you for bringing them to be a part of us. And I really pray as they put their roots down deeper into you and deeper into what you want them to be doing here, that you would richly bless them and lead them on into all that you are speaking to them about at this time. Bless them, Lord. Bless their family. Bless little Caleb. And Lord, thank you for the blessing that they are already. We really appreciate them and love them and want them to know that they are loved and accepted by all of us. Amen. I, I don't know if <coughs> you guys, uh, I was uh, reminded of this prayer that Paul prays in Ephesians and it's, uh, it's kind of worth listening just how much of this is God and how much of this is us. Um, I pray that from the Father's glorious, unlimited resources, He will empower you with inner strength through His Spirit. Then Christ will make His home in your hearts as you trust in Him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And God's kind of got the, the kind of the unlimited resources. And our part is to uh, to trust Him and to to let our roots go down. I just want to, I just want to pray that for you guys. Uh, Lord, thank you for, <laughs> for making that home with us. Uh, Lord, I pray that this will be a place where they can trust you. And Lord, that this will be a place where their roots can go down and draw life and goodness from your love, Jesus. Amen. So this morning when we um, set up, we just randomly put some pens and paper on the table. And um, I hadn't really noticed what it was on there particularly. We kind of wasn't, it was just what was left in the box. But when we were praying, I just got really drawn. I had to go and pick up one of the colouring sheets and actually really felt God's, it says, all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed. And actually, I really felt God say, he has given you guys something really special. You have such faith. Um, and actually, God's got plans for you guys to just for, to widen your hearts and your minds for others, to actually plant those seeds into others. I think we've got a real gift of just building others up and putting that faith in others. And actually, I've really felt God say, you know, I, you're here and you're joining this family because actually this is where you're going to throw, I can't say the word, flourish, but also you're going to help others too as well because actually you're going to, that faith that flows through you will flow through this church. Um, I felt like God wanted to tell Sloan that he sees you're a princess and you're very beautiful and don't let anybody ever tell you anything different because he knows the truth. Mummy and Daddy will remind you when you need to know too. Father, I want to thank you for this beautiful family. Father, thank you for, for Sloan and Seb, Lord, for the way that... Um, 
Vincent and Beth are raising them, Father, for all that they are bringing as they join our family here in Lifehouse. Lord, would you grow us together as a strong family, Lord, as these people join us. Lord, would you expand our hearts to be family together. Join us together and move us forwards as family, Lord. Your plan is for family always to grow. That's the way you build your kingdom. Lord, help us to grow kingdom together. Father, thank you for all you're adding to us as you join these people to us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Yeah, Lord, we thank you for these families. Lord, and we pray that today is a new day. Not that the past is wrong or bad, but today is a new day. A new joining. Lord, there's a new walking differently. Lord, there's new connections, there's new family. Lord God, there's new purpose and there's new fruitfulness. And we want to pray, would you bless them, Lord God, as they're added in and bless us. Lord God, we want to pray, would we bless them too. Would you join us together as family, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's give them a round of applause. Brilliant. We're going to be running another DNA um, session uh, coming up in the next few months. Uh, if you'd like to be part of that, if you'd like to say, we'd like to make this our church, we'd like to become members, um, please speak to me or email uh, admin at lifehousereachchurch.co.uk and we can uh, have a conversation and get you on the next uh, one of the DNAs that's coming up. Brilliant. I'm going to just quickly go through a couple of things and then children and young people, you're going to go out. Um, on the 28th of June, we have our church family meeting, 7.45 at West Bister Community Centre. That's for all of Lifehouse. We're gathered together for our church family meeting, 7.45 um, on the 28th of June. We're going to spend time worshipping God. We're going to spend time in His presence. But we've also got some really exciting news to tell you. So the 28th of June, we've got really exciting news, like really, really exciting news to tell you on the 28th of June. I'm not going to say any more. <laughs> um, can we play that video quickly, uh, Rian? I want to tell you about something else called School of the Spirit. School of the Spirit is a course that's happening, and we're just going to watch this video any second. They're set free, healed and filled with joy. But for many of us, life in the spirit can feel impossibly mysterious and we don't know where to start. What does it even feel like to be led by the spirit? How do you hear his voice and then what do you do next? Midweek course. School of the Spirit is a six-month midweek course for followers of Jesus who want to live life just like Jesus did, bringing the kingdom of God with him wherever he went, seeing people set free, healed, and filled with joy. But for many of us, life in the Spirit can feel impossibly mysterious, and we don't know where to start. What does it even feel like to be led by the Spirit? How do you hear his voice, and then what do you do next? That's exactly what we'll be exploring in this course. We won't just be learning about the Holy Spirit through our teaching sessions. We'll also be learning from the Holy Spirit, spending time worshipping in His presence and trying things out through special activities designed to deepen our relationship with God. And key to all of that is our small group life, because life in the Spirit was never supposed to be something that we do alone. All students for the duration of the course are split into small groups, and these are safe places to build strong relationships and cheer each other on as we take steps of courage. Last year we saw people get healed, hear the voice of God for the first time, pray for people on the streets of Oxford and experience personal freedom. Here are just a couple of stories. So some people came to speak to us and they spoke about healing. They prayed for me and I have back pain historical um, from a historical injury that was inflicted on me by, by another person. And this was over 40 years ago, so I've had that all this time. Um, and when they prayed, 
and the pain started to go and it was tangible. I could feel it moving, changing. To be honest, I had only faith the size of a mustard seed. It's been so long, but I'm so grateful to God and feel so blessed. I really appreciated the expectation that was set by those leading the course that every time we got together, God would have new things for us, things with which to bless us. And so as we gathered and we waited on God, uh, there was a lively expectation that good things were coming. And they did, like week by week, time after time that we met, whether it was uh, encouragement or refreshment or revelation or challenge, uh, there was a regular encounter with God, and I just loved um, the regular coming into God's presence and receiving all that he had for me. We are so excited about what God will do on School of the Spirit this year. If you think this might be for you, visit our webpage or email us for more information at sots at occ.org.uk. Great, so uh, Life Ashwick Church and Oxford Community Church work really closely together. Um, this is a fantastic course. Um, it's been in the pilot stages for the last couple of years. You might have noticed uh, our very own Jane uh, has just been part of it. Um, it is now open for everyone to go on this course. You can't just turn up, you need to book in, okay? Uh, we'll put more details in our newsletter. It's going to start in the autumn. It's a physical sign of something that happens inwardly. Something spiritual is going on when someone is anointed. And being anointed was special. It didn't just happen to anyone. It was a symbol that you were set apart. That you were chosen for a specific purpose. In the Old Testament, anointing is a symbol of calling is a symbol of leadership, but it's more than that. It identifies and sets apart people who bridge the gap between heaven and earth. Anointed people represent God to his people, and they represent the people of Israel before God. They are walking, talking points where heaven and earth meet. And often, when someone is anointed in the Old Testament, as oil is poured on their head, God also pours out his Holy Spirit on them, and they are filled with his power and his love. They become a point where heaven and earth meet, and where humans and God draw close to one another. Now hopefully this helps us understand the idea of anointing. It's not just like getting given a specific job to do, but it's being set apart as a person who brings something of heaven to earth and represents God to humanity. In the Old Testament, there's three groups of people who are anointed. You've got the priests, who mediate between God and his people through offering sacrifices. You've got the prophets, who communicate the words and the will of God to his people. And then what we're looking at today is the kings who represent God's rule, the kingdom of God as seen on earth. And each of these groups of people represent something specific of God's nature to his people through their role in the nation of Israel. They provide a point where the kingdom of heaven comes to earth. And today we're looking at Saul and David, who were Israel's first anointed kings. So if you've got Bibles or phones with you, let's turn together to 1 Samuel 15, and we're going to read from verse 17. So far in the story of 1 Samuel, the nation of Israel has demanded a king, and so God sent the prophet Samuel to anoint a young man named Saul, to set him apart for the role of when Saul was anointed, he was filled with God's Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit empowered him to go into battle and rescue Israel from their enemies. But we've seen in recent chapters that Saul's position and power 
has begun to go to his head. He's begun to disobey God's instructions and trust in his own military skills rather than trusting in God. So we pick up the action with Samuel, the prophet, confronting Saul about his disobedience. Samuel said to Saul, Although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel, and he sent you on a mission, saying, Go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did obey the Lord, Saul said. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and I brought back Agag, their king. Completely destroyed. Brought back the king. The soldiers took sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied to Saul, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination, and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. God values our obedience over our ability. Saul could have been a good king. We're told in 1 Samuel that he was physically striking and impressive. He was, stood taller than all the other men of Israel. The sort of face that you put on a staff. And what's more, he was a talented military tactician. When he obeys God, the nation of Israel are victorious against their enemies. But we see here that when he refuses to obey God, his anointing as Israel's king is taken away from him. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. If we're honest, we can relate to that, can't we? Saul has been given specific instructions that his army are not to take plunder from their defeated enemies, that he gives in to the peer pressure from his men. As the anointed king of Israel, it should be Saul that makes the rules for his army. But rather than putting his foot down, he caves to the peer pressure from his men and allows them to amass wealth and possessions for themselves from the job that God gave them to do. So wanting to please the people around him leads Saul to disobey God. Where have we disobeyed God? Where have we valued other people's opinions of us more than doing what God has called us to do? The root of Saul's disobedience is his pride. Samuel points out that Saul was once small in his own eyes. He was a humble man, but his anointing has gone to his head. Now that he's king, he's more concerned with looking like what he thinks a king should look like than doing what God says. He thinks it's important that a king has a loyal army of soldiers. So he disobeys God's command in order to keep his men on side. He values looking like a king more than obeying the commands of God. 
Saul's disobedience means that he isn't showing the people of Israel what God looks like. He models for them what he thinks a king should look like, rather than modeling what God is like. And that's not what the anointed king of Israel is meant to do. He's been set apart as a point where heaven and earth draw near. A person who represents God to his people. And yet he consistently disobeys God. If Saul is God's representative to the people, what impression is he giving of what God's like? And so God fires him as his representative. Saul's disobedience overshadows his anointing. And so God sends Samuel to anoint a new king of Israel. A king who will be a person after God's own heart. We pick up the story again in 1 Samuel 16. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. Smart man. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by. But Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. From the story of Saul, we saw that God values our obedience over our ability. Here, as Samuel anoints David, we see that God values our character over our circumstances. In some ways, it's quite a comical scene. One by one, Jesse's sons pass in front of Samuel, and none of them are the one he's been called to anoint. If I was Samuel, I'd be asking God, uh, are we sure this is the right address? All the sons have gone through now, and there's not the right one here. Samuel trusts God, and we see that the youngest son, David, is the one that God has chosen to be king. Now, as the youngest son in that culture, 
David would have been the lowest ranking in the family. So much so that when Samuel comes to the house, David's still out looking after the sheep. The household receives great honor when Samuel comes to visit them. But David isn't called back and invited to the party. He's almost an afterthought in the story. He's not originally included in this lineup of Jesse's sons. It feels like it's only when Samuel specifically asks for him that his dad remembers his existence. But in this story, we see that the afterthought, the son who by society's standards was the least important, is the one that God chose to represent him to the people of Israel as their king. When David is anointed, God fills him with the Holy Spirit from that day on. God values our character over our circumstances. Samuel is impressed by Jesse's eldest son, Eliab. He immediately assumes that he's the one God has chosen. He hasn't learned his lesson from impressive but prideful Saul. But God challenges Samuel's assumption. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. It is David's heart that matters to God, not his position within the social structure. David is described as a man after God's own heart. And we see through the book of 1 Samuel that when a Saul trusts in his own power and strength, David chooses instead to trust God, even when that might make him look foolish to the people around him. Do you ever feel like an afterthought? Like, why would God ever call me to do something? God doesn't think you're an afterthought. He wants relationship with you, and he wants to partner with you in showing people who he is. We can often disqualify ourselves from doing things for God based on our circumstances, but God values our character over our circumstances. I think there's people here who are carrying a lot of self-rejection. You've written yourself off from stepping into what God is calling you to do. Maybe you think you're too old now, or too awkward, or you've made too many mistakes during the course of your life. But none of that is true. God wants relationship with you. He loves you. And he's calling you today to represent him and to work with him again. We're going to hear more of the story of David over the next few weeks. He went on to be a great king of Israel, who showed the people that worshipping God was at the heart of what it meant to be king. Yeah, he made mistakes, and quite a few. He wasn't always the perfect representation of God to his people. But at the end of his life, God promises David that from his descendants will come somebody who will be this perfect representation of God on earth. The prophets of the Old Testament speak about this anointed person from the line of David, who will bridge the gap between God and his people. Jesus was this anointed person. He was the Son of God who took on human form and was born into a household descended from David. He was filled with the Holy Spirit and obeyed God throughout his life. And he died on the cross to bridge the gap between us and God. When Jesus died, he got rid of our sins, restoring us into relationship with God the Father. What's more, death wasn't the end. Jesus rose again from the dead. After appearing to the disciples, he ascended to heaven, where he is seated at the right hand of Father God. Amen? This is, this is good news. Amen. Christ isn't Jesus' surname, by the way. He wasn't born to Joseph and Mary Christ. Christ means the anointed one. It's just the Greek word for it. 
So like the anointed priests in the Old Testament, Jesus represents us to God through his sacrifice on the cross. And he mediates between us and God. Like the anointed prophets, he is the divine word of God. He communicates God's will to us as his people. And like the anointed kings, he represents God's kingdom on earth. He shows us what God's rule is like. And he calls us to do that too. The word Christian means little Christ. So as followers of Jesus, as Christians, we're called to be little Christs, little anointed ones. God anoints us by filling us with his Holy Spirit. He dwells within our hearts when we invite him into our lives. We are called to represent God to the people around us, to be places where heaven and earth meet. And we're not chosen for that because of our abilities or because of our circumstances. We can have this relationship with God, this anointing, because of Jesus' death on the cross. Where have we disobeyed God? Where have we not pursued the things that he has called us to do? Where have we disqualified ourselves from doing things for God? Where have we rejected ourselves due to our circumstances? What is God calling each of us to do for him today? We're going to take some time to each quietly reflect on these questions and seek God. And then I'm going to lead us in a prayer of response. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against other people through our thoughts, through our words, and through our actions. We have sinned through our negligence, through our weakness, and through our own deliberate fault and the choices that we have made. We confess that we have disobeyed you and we've valued our own ambitions and desires more than we have valued you. Have mercy on us, Lord. We're sorry that we have disqualified ourselves from serving you and from representing you based on our circumstances. We are truly sorry. And we repent of all our sins. We turn away from that and we turn towards you. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, please forgive us. And Father, anoint us afresh. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we can represent who you are to those around us. Would you make us into points where the kingdom of heaven touches earth, where we can serve you and bring you glory? Speak to us. Call us afresh into what you have for us to do. And all God's people said, Amen.
Okay, thanks, Chris. Um, you might want to respond to that individually. We'd, we'd love to pray for you. It might be that you disqualified yourself, and today we want to set you free from that. God wants to set you free from that. It might be that you want to receive more of the Holy Spirit to be empowered to be sent out. And so if you want prayer, um, maybe you need prayer for healing as well. We're speaking about in Jesus' name, we're singing that. If you need healing today as well, um, we're just going to leave the front clear and free for people to come and receive prayer. So if you want prayer, come and do that. Um, secondly, we haven't taken our offering um, today. We'll put the bowl on the table at the back. Um, if you want to give, please um, put it in the bowl. Or there's ways to give on a, a monthly basis, on a regular basis. All the details are in that. We'll do that there. Next week, um, we have brunch in Banbury at 10 a.m. Um, we're going to do bacon butties. Um, please bring some bacon, please bring some bread rolls or something like that. That would be great. Um, and Bista, 2.30 here, afternoon tea. Please bring a sweet or a savoury. That would be perfect. And can I ask you to ask the question, who is it that you can invite next week? Our brunches and afternoon teas are the perfect places to invite those that don't know God yet. So who is it that you could invite? Not only bring your bacon or your savoury or your sweet, but who could you bring with you? So next week, brunch and afternoon tea. And I think I've not forgotten anything, but you never know. Um, if you've got children, please don't do go and collect them um, from upstairs. That would be fantastic. And if you want prayer, don't go without getting prayer. Come to the front and we'd love for someone to be praying with you. That would be great. Have a blessed week and we'll see you soon.